This is a recording of Insights Towards Sanity, The Art of Having Schizophrenia. This is part one, The Birdcage for Spirit, an autobiography of intense philosophy. Chapter one, Recognition of Chrysalis, the Early Stage of Life. In this opening chapter, I want to share my first memories of life. I was born and grew up in a small town on Vancouver Island, BC, Canada, close to the Pacific Ocean and thick forests. I was always close to nature, and I had a nourishing family environment. I was allowed to be independent, and I was supported. My mom has told me I was always very unique, different, and odd. She used different terms at unique times for whenever I was being odd. To be honest, My memories are often more vague than they seem to be for other people. My memories are conceptual and internal. I fear this book may be too conceptual, but for me to write anything else would be contrived. This is an autobiographical work in part, but I am not good with chronology. There may be inconsistencies. It is perhaps more of an auto-psychology than a graphic facsimile of events in my life. It is highly focused on what I thought about my thoughts. What am I? To be all honest, from the very outset of my remembered life, as long as I have known I am Brendan, I have been acutely fascinated by being thoughtfully aware of what it is like to be me. Ever since I can remember, I have lived with curiosity about being alive. I have always remembered wondering what was going to happen next. Life was an amazing experiment for me as a child. I looked out to the world at others and behaved with a sense of deep awe and adventure and wonderment at the very fact that I was able to live it. I later learned in my philosophy education that my object of interest was self-awareness. I learned my most naturally found childhood play tool was freedom of imagination and my potential choices. I've known ever since I can remember that I have been on a quest of learning more and more about the nature of my experience before I even had words to describe that. The joyful wonder I have at the fact that we have choices to make and games to play has never left me. My earliest memory is the memory of thinking about how beautiful, how truly demanding, and how free my next thought and motion would always be. Of course, I hadn't any abstract words to express it in this way, but there was something percolating in my mind from my earliest memory. That was an abstract sense of self that was very compelling and often in my thoughts. I didn't know what to do at all, but I knew I had as many options as I could conceive and have access to. I knew from the initiation of my sense of identity that human life was a magic of perception and of learning how to behave. My schedule was open and I pounced on every exchange with others and every moment alone was a source of learning. That's all there was, it seemed to me. Everything and everyone I came to had some contribution to my experience which I could integrate into my picture of reality. Didn't know the word reality, but it seems to me I've thought about it forever. I feel I barely even remember childhood events of my life. However, I remember thinking often about what it all meant. What does it mean to persist so long in wondering what it means? Much of this experience has been non-verbal throughout my life, but has been explosively verbal in recent years, upcoming to 2012 at time of writing, especially since reading a book or two on anything that made me curious. I picked up on the fact that sages, mystics, scientists, artists, and philosophers had been inquiring and expounding directly for millennia on the subjects of my deepest interest. As I have been given language for it, my picture of reality that I've had since I was a child has become increasingly grasped with language and become gradually more communicable. Regardless of skeptical arguments I have now heard in the philosophy of mind, and regardless of my initial need to learn language, 
there is a constant apprehension. I have always been inoperably convinced that all of reality is only really about conscious living beings exploring and developing access to expression, experience, and energy. I've listened to the arguments as a philosophy major, but nothing sways me from my intuition that life and living, as I have imaged it, full of play, is the most important aspect to the nature of existence. In the car on a family trip that took three and a half hours of driving, I was very hungry and cranky for food and cranky from the long ride. I remember not being able to see the ground from my low vantage in the seat while looking up through the window at trees, sky, and buildings. I was complaining to my parents about my desire to eat immediately, and they were telling me to wait just a little bit longer. My dad finally got annoyed enough to burst my idealistic dream with a logical point of truth. I could very easily sit and cry frenetically and whine for food the whole way until we get there, or I could sit peacefully as I could, because I still won't get food until we get there, sorry. And there it was, the birth of my concept of free will. I became quiet and rest assured that the choice was made up in the mind of my parents and that there was no use on my part in whining further. Lessons you only keep on learning. I realized very consciously that I had learned completely the lessons of patience. Admittedly, part of them. It consisted in the willing choice to complain or be as calm or resolute as possible no matter what your pangs of desire for a change in situation. They didn't buy me a drive through fast food burger, some junk food snack to tide me over. I had been complaining every time I saw a convenience store or restaurant sign as I looked out the window. Then my dad spoke, and I remember quieting with the thought that emerged. I ate at my grandparents' house and was satisfied for the rest of the car ride with having realized that it just hurt me to complain when there were no good options. I just rested quietly and waited with the feeling in my belly because I had some choice in how to react to a hunger. I strove after that to understand and contemplate my desires without responding to the situation by fighting or complaining. I'm not always a perfect communicator and occasionally a mood overwhelms my sensibilities. As a result of this patience and desire not to fight with what the world offers, I eventually excelled academically at school, resisted bullies, and defended the bullied, and made great friends with people who seemed to not have many friends. Gazing out the window at all the potential. Also, I could enjoy time by myself without being fed continual activity input. I was not a demanding child. Instead, I was quiet and speculative, and up for experiencing everything I could see was available. My mom says my favorite spot in the house was always my crib, looking out a window. I was patient with situations while looking for ways to create the best from them. I developed a sense of knowing myself to be in such a state that was totally different from the alternative of just living with a task fully at mind without self-reflecting constantly. Being self-conscious is almost a problem for me, while it also enriches me. Quite honestly, I've been preoccupied as long as I can remember with seeing how the next moment will affect my consciousness, and with finding something in this moment which I could bring to others. It has been easy for me my whole life to go amidst normal activity while quite deeply I am pondering how I fit in the moment, how I feel and how I will think next or relate with others. In childhood and early school life, I acquired the notion of myself as very unique because I didn't feel that others felt or conceived their own experience as intensely as I did. It occurred to me very early in my remembered life that I was a special thinker with unique methods of knowing and relating to my experiences. I cared greatly for the experience of experience, beyond the simple joys of playing with toys or games. When I had time to daydream, I might wonder about what it meant to be alive and aware. 
childhood dreaming during sleep was a psychedelic learning experience. I often have felt many of the people around me were just doing things without thinking as deeply about the meaning as I was. I felt my role in situations was ambiguous. I just went along with what everyone was doing while living a very rich inner life divided from the ability or venue to communicate it quite yet. Looking out for guidance. If a philosopher of mind had ever spoke to me when I was a child, I would have been entranced and giddy with excitement. To have heard someone talking about free will and mental effort would have made an instant friend, but I don't remember that ever happening. When, in grade 9 or 10, I found a philosophy book of 19th and 20th century essays, I was amazed and intrigued by reading a bunch of old guys' views. Their visions and insights made me think of things I had already felt I had inquired into in different ways within the space of my own reasonings. It blew my mind to realize that many humans have thought over the ages about the intense and deep nature of consciousness. I grew in feeling that I was not alone in my long contemplation and I realized there were a whole lot more perspectives and ideas and work on these subjects than had occurred to me thus far. I began to devour philosophy and ancient spiritual and religious texts, fitting my own experience of the mind into the ever-expanding picture provided by the life work of other minds. Until then, I felt very alone, albeit not depressively for the most part. In my kind of thinking, my childhood was spent coolly contemplating for myself the nature of life and the world. Beside these preoccupations and passions, I participated socially, mostly normally, whatever the definition of normal precisely should be. Something to keep in mind, being normal is what's most weird. I participated simply because it was easy and fun to, not because I felt embedded in it. I often questioned, inside at least, the necessity of various behaviors others seemed to rely on or would normalize as I came to understand more later. I realize as an educated adult now that much of growing up for anyone is an interplay of social identities, language and culture, and power systems. I had so many dreams and deep contemplations and never knew what to do with them. So it was in feeling alone I didn't even realize at times that there were possible words and fellows in my way of thinking somewhere out there to communicate with. I felt huge wonder, curiosity, and desires about communication, expression, and experience. It just occurs to me now, while writing, that a reader might be wondering how this growth and curiosity of mine would get turned around into schizophrenia, a condition of great suffering, confusion, and isolation. There is more to my story, if you stick around than flowery language regarding my personal beneficial experience with learning about and accessing the world as deeply profound. And thus I begin my book with this chapter about recognizing myself as having a deep conceptual and philosophical experience with this world. I must be the first to identify as weird as many, many schizophrenics and neurodivergent others have been told behind and to their face over the years, I'm sure. Of course, my experiences are particular to me, and on average, I would say generalizations are usually obscure, misleading, shallow, or valid only within narrow, often tense degrees. What are insights toward sanity? Here, my experience of schizophrenia and my own consciousness is my own experience. Every case is different. This book is both autobiography as well as forays into some generalizations. If you continue reading, at the very least you will learn something about what seemed insightful to me as I approached my problems. 
In the next chapter, I will begin to describe how I came to be schizophrenic, or in more specific words, what led me on the path to chronic and eventually full-blown storm-force psychosis filled with incredible hallucinations and delusions. I will begin to describe how I got lost in the mysteries of consciousness and conditions of suffering. In the course of a few chapters, I will tell you what I feel and think about some aspects of my teenage life. By the end of my story, most readers would probably find some details quite surprising, but lacking in depiction. I write this paragraph during revision in 2019. At 2012, when this book was published, I was still very much in the darkness of confusion about some of my experiences. Ever read The Perks of Being a Wallflower? Popular media and cultural movement today actually makes it easier to say this aloud and clear. Hashtag me too. I live a story of past teenage sexual abuse by two sickening, violent, corrupt, and much older men. This book is not an outset about that story. However, one in four girls is sexually abused, and one in six boys is, and mostly by older men. Moreover, it's pointless, or impossible, to separate the story of abuse from the story of mental health. Sometimes while reading, you might get hints, and those who understand will see me coming out as well as still hiding. That said, I won't be heavily revising my first edition writing to depict this dimension of my story, besides in the way I am now. I point it out for completeness, and so it is less of a surprise. I will be writing a couple more chapters at the end of my revision to discuss some insights of the last seven years of surviving. Some remark on the word chrysalis. Chrysalis, noun, a cocoon or pod-like stage of insect metamorphosis. I have come to see, especially for certain sensitive and aware children, the world's meaning folds the contexts and situations of the kid's life into a kind of chrysalis for a pattern of adult individual. Children live in a kind of closed world of meaning where perpetual, perceptual learning relationships with the world and a sort of profanely mystical unification easily inspires one to imagine and reason. The metaphor of a chrysalis fits because babies are born alive with their eyes closed and then grow up to emerge slowly from their individualism into profound relation with the world. There is an incessant probing and forming of our psyche by nature, family, friends, and society. We enter the world once, but then branch out again from each unique chrysalis of becoming. There is something in this about the risk of the pod-like stage. We are affected by the pressures, constrained by the pre-existing culture, and forced by adults. We all grow in a way similar to this piecing together an idea of the self that we can't help but by nature consciously experience. It is an idea of purpose, function, and career as conscious self. We emerge from each chrysalis of development whenever we become able to understand and participate in larger and more complex domains of action and response. We emerge or become something more adult when we can interact independently with conscious knowledge of our behavior, and be responsible. It's important to point out, even many young adults as well as many old adults missed a lesson or two. They aren't taking responsibility, and they formed from their own tormenting beginnings into hostile and violent traits. In comparison, we might as adults keep experimenting and following out all manners of life by testing, pushing, and pulling on anything with various degrees of wonder, openness, desire, and caution toward what happens. Curiosity is a good moral principle, too. Every healthy child pursues such wonder to learn with the intention both of becoming more like themselves as well as to uplift and protect their peers forever. Of course, Rendered in some way mute and powerless, they have the need simply to sponge up the world and develop for a long time. 
The child, like a chrysalis, is vulnerable to several influences. I feel like I am always beginning to figure out what my deeper nature is. More onion layers, I suppose. Learning to play and playing to learn have figured in my sense of being a living explorer. Once encumbered with great vision but few words, now I am ready to share and speak my mind. This was Chapter 1, Recognition of Chrysalis, the Early Stage of Life, from Insights Towards Sanity, The Art of Having Schizophrenia, by Brendan MacDonald.